Hello there. Uh, welcome to this webinar. We're focusing today on the US presidential election that's coming up quite quickly now at the beginning of November. I'm delighted to say that uh, I've got Freddie Gray here with me, and Freddie's the editor of The Spectator US. And some of you may remember Freddie from our 2018 investment conference at the Oval. Uh, and Freddie is one of the better placed people to talk to us about uh, the election, the campaign, the ramifications it may have both in the US and over in the UK here. Um, and um, I'm delighted to say he's given up some time this morning. So thank you, Freddie. First question to you. Um, so as you're seeing things today, and we are a few weeks away still from the election, how close do you think this contest will be? And if it is going to be an extremely close run thing, what are the likelihood of it being contested? Uh, my impression is that this is going to be an extremely close election. Uh, I would ignore the national polls, which uh, show Biden has a clear advantage, and look at the battleground states that are looking very, very tight. Um, if you look at Florida, that is often seen to be the key state, that is now looking slightly favourable for Trump, which would mean that the race will go absolutely down to the wire. Uh, I would say one thing that a lot of pro-Trump pundits and analysts are missing is that there are certain states that Trump won in 2016 that are looking a bit weak, like Georgia, um, possibly Ohio, Arizona. Um, so where the sort of the, the famous battleground states, which are Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania and Florida, they could all go for Trump, but he could lose certain other key states, which would mean he slips up. But let's assume that it's a very, very close run thing, and I think it will be. I think the real nightmare scenario, and I imagine from an investing perspective, an absolute disaster, is uh, that we will have no certain result within uh, a week, perhaps even a month of the election. And if that sounds hysterical, bear with me, because uh, there will be a lot of mail-in ballots, and there's already furious fights uh, taking place over mail-in balloting, uh, so a scenario that a lot of people think is going to happen is that um, on election night itself, uh, you will have a Trump win, a clear Trump victory. And then in the days that follow, uh, mail-in ballots will sort of undo that result. So you may even have a scenario where Trump declares victory on election night and then it is contested in the days that follow. And what happens then is uh, kind of up in the air. I mean, it's, it, it could be a serious disaster. Uh, and they, there's a thing called the Transition Integrity Project, uh, which is run by a bunch of Democrats and sort of anti-Trump Republicans. And they looked at various scenarios. And the worst possible scenario was uh, a Trump win because uh, the Democrats would contest it. And then it would and then they would possibly if they didn't trust the result, they would ask California to succeed from the union uh, and to break up possibly into five states. So, I mean, we are, if Trump wins again by a narrow margin or a contestable margin, we are looking at um, a sort of social breakdown. And I know that sounds hysterical, but uh, if you've been following America closely, you'll know that I'm not really exaggerating. Thanks for that. That's uh, a little bit disconcerting. But um, as I said, we're a, few, we're a few weeks away from the election. And clearly, this election is really quite a lot about COVID and the response to COVID. And, and we've seen over the last few months that the COVID situation is getting worse, but perhaps it seems like it might be plateauing a bit. How would you sort of read the next few weeks with regards to COVID? Is it going to benefit Trump more than Biden? Or is it not as simple as that? Well, uh, I think Trump's sort of COVID response is, is a loss for him. Uh, I think it, it sort of widely uh, the, the wider impression, the, the majority impression, is that Trump was a bit scrambled by COVID. He started doing these daily press briefings at the height of the crisis, and that was not really very helpful for him because he seemed to be uh, totally out of his depth, uh, and he has that tendency to ramble. And in a sort of uh, really grave national crisis, I think a lot of people thought we need a serious leader, and this is not a serious leader. However, I do think the Democrats um, tend to uh, overemphasize what a win COVID is for them. And often they are seen to be sort of cheering on COVID. 
which is not a good look for any political party. Um, I think that it, it, an, an, an issue, uh, uh, one issue that the Democrats don't don't want to uh, get absorbed in is COVID itself rather than Medicare, because in 2018, in the midterms, they won quite quite significantly by stressing Medicare, and you can't trust. And the line was, you can't trust Donald Trump with your health care. Uh, but because COVID has sort of blown up everything and so dominates uh, the news agenda now, uh, it's really the only healthcare issue people are thinking about. So they're not thinking about Obamacare and whether Trump will tear that up. They're just thinking about uh, COVID. And to a large extent, Trump has made uh, COVID treatment uh, federally covered. So it's not a sort of money issue for most people, um, a money concern for most people. There may be issues about that. We'll find out later. But for now, it's about whether Trump handled the pandemic well. It's not about whether you can trust the Republicans with Medicare. And that normally is a big win for the Democrats. But COVID has sort of taken that out of the equation. That's one of the sectors that obviously is, is very impactful the result of the presidential election, healthcare. I just want to move on to two of the others that are very much in the spotlight, um, uh, which include the energy sector and technology, of course, both big constituents of the S&P 500. Um, very different views between the candidates on energy, um, uh, but perhaps a little bit more um, togetherness on technology and what to do with taxes um, on perhaps big tech companies. Do you have a view on both of those sectors? Well, I think on energy, I think you'll see, uh, I mean, really, Biden doesn't have many original ideas. I mean, there's a huge, lengthy uh, manifesto, various manifestos on his website. Uh, but really, you'll see a return to pre-Trump settings with the Biden administration. So uh, essentially, everything uh, that Obama did, Biden will, will carry on doing. Um, perhaps even more emphasis on a Green New Deal, because the Democrats know that's a a big driver for them. So you will see uh, huge investments in, in green technology if Biden wins and so on. And you will not get that with Trump because he famously pulled out of the Paris Accords. Uh, I think Biden will get America back into the Paris Accords very quickly. Uh, and as for technology, I think a very interesting, uh, I, I would say the big tech would probably be wanting, I mean, seems to be wanting a Biden victory because Trump has made quite a lot of noises, although he hasn't actually done much, and quite what he could do is a bigger question, about uh, big tech censorship. That's one of his big beefs. You know, this idea that uh, Facebook, uh, Google, and YouTube uh, all sort of um, restrict free speech if it's conservative. And this is a major issue. It really annoys uh, a lot of right-wingers in America, uh, and it's a good vote driver. But uh, quite what Trump can do to tackle these giants, which are now really sort of more powerful than governments, is is another matter. So I think on, on tech, I would say uh, big tech would bet on Biden. Uh, on energy, green energy would be very enthused by uh, Biden. Uh, Biden has promised he will not, uh, he isn't going to stop fracking. But then he's given quite mixed signals on that. Uh, he has to appeal to the, the green wing of his party that is very anti-fracking. You, you were very much involved uh, in Trump's 2016 campaign. Um, involved. Terrifying. Uh, well, you followed it very closely. And um, just looking at um, Trump's campaign this time, and ultimately, you know, if Trump was to win in 2020, what, what actually is he going to do for the next four years? What is the manifesto this time from, um, from Trump? Well, I mean, his, his manifesto now... <laughs> is quite an odd one uh, at the moment because it's sort of saying it's looking a lot at the Black Lives Matter riots and saying this is what will happen to America if you don't elect me and re-elect me. And this is an odd position for a president to have because essentially what he's saying is vote for Trump to stop the things that are happening under Trump happening. So whether that works uh, as a message, I don't know. But as for what Trump does uh, until 2024, I think you may see a big tech fight. Uh, I think you're going to see him try and make good on things like the wall, uh, the, the wall promise. You will see him try and make good on um, 
uh, various various other areas. Sorry, I'm trying to think think what what he'll do. Uh, he will um, uh, he will withdraw from Afghanistan. I would have thought um, he's been trying to do that for a long time. Uh, there's talks ongoing at the moment, uh, and there will be a lot of the neocons within his administration. A lot of the war hawks will be very keen to strike Iran as soon as Trump is re-elected. Whether Trump is committed to that is uh, a matter for debate. Um, but I would have thought the Trump administration will be dovish in, in terms of foreign policy, uh, withdrawing from foreign wars, uh, with the possible exception of Iran, where you might have a, a military strike quite soon after he's re-elected. So, so that, that moves nicely into um, what my next question is going to be from it's moving into geopolitics a bit here. Um, what, what, and who, who do you think China and Russia would like as the next president of the United States between the two candidates? Well, I think China are sort of trying to put out through official channels that they would be quite happy with a Trump re-election. Uh, I think that almost certainly means they wouldn't be. Uh, I think as far as um, China is concerned, Trump is a big headache for them, uh, and they'd much rather he went away. Biden famously had a pretty good relationship with China when he was vice president. Uh, I think, you know, he famously said, do you think America's, uh, do you think China's going to eat America's lunch? Come on, man. Uh, I think China, Trump, Biden doesn't really want to regard China as a threat to America. Uh, Trump really does. So in terms of China, I think they definitely want Biden. Russia's a bit more peculiar because I think having wanted famously uh, Trump to win in 2016, they now uh, are also a bit muddled by him because Trump is so sort of compromised on Russia. There's so much suspicion around his relations with Russia that he's had to be much tougher on Russia than he normally would be. So I, I think Russia would be ambivalent as far as we understand from their bots uh, they want to um, cause depression and chaos in America, and they seem to be doing a pretty good job of that. M moving on to uh, the, the UK, of course, we've got our ongoing negotiations um, with the European Union, but also the US trade negotiations are ongoing as well. Um, how will the result impact those negotiations? I mean, we saw Biden come out um, to um, state his support for the Good Friday Agreement. I mean, it seems on the surface that um, our Prime Minister would probably prefer a, a Trump victory. Um, but again, is it as simple as that? Uh, I don't think it is as simple as that, simply because a lot of Tories just aren't very comfortable dealing with the Trump administration because the Trump administration is quite crazy. Uh, and so they, they sort of, I think a lot of even Brexiteers would in their heart of hearts sort of admit that they prefer to deal with the Biden administration because the Biden administration would be uh, very similar to the Obama administration, which famously had a good relationship. Um, uh, I, I, I think in terms of, you know, who Brexit, what, what is best for Brexit Britain, I think you probably have to say a Trump re-election because Biden will return to, as I say, pre-Trump settings, and Obama famously said Britain would be at the back of the queue in any future trade talks. I think Britain will find itself back there uh, if Biden wins, and I think his intervention on Ireland recently suggests that's definitely the case. Just going to return to um, uh, domestic US politics, although this has branched out um, on a, in, in a global perspective as well, and I'm focusing this time on, on Black Lives Matter. Um, clearly, it's had a big impact over the last six months um, for both candidates. Um, do you believe um, that Black Lives Matter will continue um, uh, beyond the, the, the November election? Um, and from an outsider's point of view, looking in on the US, do you think it is a benefit to the US, this, this movement, or, or actually is it, is it to the detriment of the US? I think, uh, I mean, when it happened, there was a there was a moment when George Floyd was killed and the horrible video was circulated everywhere. There was a there was a clear moment and an outcry, uh, which was significant. There's no denying that that was significant. But I think that what happened afterwards, the riots um, that went on, that a lot of the media insisted in calling protests when they were clearly just uh, devastating riots. I think that is uh, perhaps the one thing uh, that the Democrats um, could have could have got wrong that would make make them lose the election. And amazingly, they they did get it wrong. 
uh, it took them weeks to condemn uh, violence on the streets. Um, and Biden and Kamala Harris uh, did not, were very reluctant to condemn protests that had the affiliation of Black Lives Matter. Uh, because, of course, of anti-racism is the key democratic mantra. Uh, I think a lot of voters, although they often might not tell pollsters, uh, were horrified by the riots in America. Um, and I think that if, if, if Trump is re-elected, we will look back at the Black Lives Matter protests that turned into riots and say this is the moment uh, that he won. Just on Brexit, Freddie, um, I, I believe that um, you know a bit about Biden's views on it, don't you? Well, I had quite a funny encounter in February uh, in the, uh, the pre-COVID era, I suppose, um, where I met Biden at a, a town hall in New Hampshire. And uh, there was quite loud music, so perhaps he couldn't hear what I was saying. But I asked him what his approach to Brexit would be. Brexit Britain, I said. And he said, who? <laughs> and so I repeated it and he said, what? And then I finally screamed Brexit Britain, Boris Johnson in his ear and a sort of lot a faint element of recognition flashed across his brain and he sort of mumbled Boris and then he wandered off. And I, I mean, I, I, I relate that story sort of jokingly, I hope, but also, I mean, I don't think it's just a right wing trope that Biden is not um, fully in charge of his senses. He's, he is old. Um, he's very doddery. Uh, he often loses his thread, uh, as do I quite often, but uh, he, I'm not running to be president. Uh, and he is, um, he's, he's a sort of Washington boy, basically, uh, a, a guy who's been in, in the capital for decades, who everybody likes because he's a nice guy, um, gets on with everyone, reaches across the aisle politically. Uh, but he's also just a bit doddery, and like a lot of doddery old men, his temper can go. We've seen this a couple of times uh, happen yesterday um, with a question about his son. Uh, he can he can lose his temper quite a lot. And 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 just you've given us a pen portrait of Biden. Um, can you provide us with a bit of a pen portrait of uh, Donald Trump, the man, rather than Donald Trump, the president? Well, I think Trump's great. Uh, gift is his, is his instinct. Uh, he has extraordinary instincts uh, and he has this great ability to say what everyone's thinking uh, and he dares to say it out loud. And for instance, yesterday he was asked about Harry and Meghan. Harry and Meghan, I don't know if you saw, uh, gave uh, an awful, excruciatingly uh, pious um, statement about the election in which they didn't precisely say you have to vote for Joe Biden, but it was obvious that's what they were getting at. Trump was asked about this uh, and he said, he paused, he smiled and he said, I'm not a fan of hers. Um, all I can say is a lot of luck to Prince Harry because he's going to need it, which I think is a sort of, you know, it's that's a, the way in which Trump is a great media genius is that he just has that instinct for what a lot of people are thinking. In terms of ideology, uh, yes, I think he believes America first. He believes in America first to a certain extent. He believes in protecting American industry. I think there's a bit of, he actually feels that. It's not just a posture. Um, but at the same time, you know, he's a pretty amoral guy who will just do whatever it takes to win. My, my last question to you, I, ha I have to put you on the spot slightly now, is given your esteemed position as the editor of the, um, the US Spectator. Uh, that's exactly what I'm going to ask for. Um, who will be the next president of the United States? Uh, Kamala Harris. Uh, I, get I, to I, think, uh, I think Trump will... Um, I, I, I will go with my first prediction, which is a bit of a fudge, but I'm afraid I have to, is that it's going to be a contested election. Uh, this will go right down to the wire. It could go even to the Supreme Court, which is just becoming more interesting. Um, and that you will not know the winner by November 10th. Uh, and by January, uh, I, I, I'll go with Trump re-election, but I, it's, it's anyone's guess. Freddie, thank you very much.